set, go. This is the fourth in our series, Implications of COVID-19, brought to you by ACTA in collaboration with Cervantes Chat Prince PC. My name is Betsy Giron, and I'm the Vice President of ACTA, and I will be your moderator today. On our panel, we have Bob Prince, attorney at CCP, and Bill Chat, also an attorney at CCP. As a brief introduction, we determined our topic today due to the recent announcements by the governor of Restore Illinois with five phases outlined as well as variations from the mayors of Chicago and other municipalities uh, throughout Illinois. Most recently, we know that protests have ensued with disagreements and criteria for each phase, and now the state legislature is returning to session next week, and they will be addressing this and, of course, budgetary matters. Unfortunately, there are many questions on how community associations should interpret these phases and what other guidelines need to be considered before actions are taken. After our presentation on this topic, we will move to an ask an attorney session, which may include questions regarding any topic. So please feel free to participate during the session, as always, by typing your questions, and I will do my best to see that they are all addressed. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill Chat. Thank you, Betsy. Um, just wanna say hello to everyone out there and uh, let everyone know that uh, we had a harrowing experience getting live today. <laughs> The uh, server in our office went down as a result of the storms last night, so we are all in um, separate uh, broadcasting locations, so hopefully everything goes okay with that. Um, that said, let's do what we always do, kind of give the, the legal landscape um, and, the, and, the, and the governmental edict um, landscape. So, um, Bob, you'll note that uh, there's been some kinks in the armor in some of the other states. Wisconsin, for one, uh, their governor's order entirely out of hand was shot down as unconstitutional as um, that was one and then out in Massachusetts um, they someone brought a suit regarding their moratorium on collection efforts which was also found to be unconstitutional um, I think the last time we spoke about it from an Illinois perspective we were kind of um, half laughing about the fact that the lawsuits were being brought in the southern counties where Cook County doesn't even realize they exist um, uh, I don't know what the, I, I don't know what the, the, um, status of the Rockford suit is, um, right now. Cause there was one that was, that was more for a statewide, um, finding, I believe. Right. Yeah, I believe so. And then, uh, I know that judge Gettleman, uh, uh, the United States district court, uh, for the Northern district of Illinois, uh, refused to enter a temporary restraining order on behalf of. Uh, a church, or I think two churches, if I recall correctly, uh, who are seeking to uh, declare uh, and be able to go back and, and worship in the interim of their, their suit. Judge Gettleman denied their request, uh, I think it was last week. And then uh, the United, I'm sorry, the Illinois Supreme Court denied the Attorney General's request for a direct appeal in the Ogle County case. Uh, and that was the uh, General Assemblyman who uh, filed the lawsuit on behalf of himself, where I you know, joke that he's probably going out with a shirt on that says, I'm free, because he's the only one that was able to go outside under his TRO. Um, so the, the, the Illinois Supreme Court refused a direct appeal, which isn't that unheard of. Um, they often want the appellate court to weigh in before they do, because uh, appellate court judges have great, you know, great insight into uh, what a decision should be. Um, and eventually, I assume it will get up to the Illinois Supreme Court. Right, so for the time being that that lower um, county um, ruling is in place, um, but it only um, applied to him. Um, so there's really nothing that we can say in terms of Illinois. Uh, but it is interesting on some of these state Supreme Courts that, especially Wisconsin, that was entirely knocked out. So um, for all intents and purposes, Wisconsin is open for business. I saw plenty of pictures of bars entirely packed yesterday. So I, I think saw that uh, and I saw business. <laughs> I saw a nurse who works in a hospital down here uh, up at a, at a bar up there and it got back to her employer. So, <laughs> so we'll see where that goes. Um, but back to Illinois, um, what we do have now is we have, I guess for lack of a better way of putting it, a roadmap that Governor Pritzker has put out there um, with phases. And I think, I think I'll bring that up right now. So we can just kind of start talking about it a little bit. And um, I want everyone to know that 
these documents that I'm going to share today, I will put up on our website, um, just so you know, for any of the um, documents that we ever use in these. Um, if you go to ccpchicago.com, um, the documents will be, we, we, if you go on the front page, there's a video and webinar link, and that'll have today's and any of the previous ones, and any of these documents we're discussing. I'll put them up there so you can download them for yourself and, and have them for reference. So without further, further ado, this is the Restore Illinois um, basic, I guess it's a continuum of phases um, to get the state back to normal, you know, pre-COVID. So uh, phase one, we are out of. That was the original stay indoors, everyone shut down, except for the initial essential uh, service providers. Um, it, it, if you look on there, it says, you know, this, it gives you the paragraph, the first paragraph is what it is. And it does say that, it, you know, if, we, if, if need be, we would go back to it. So if we get uh, a second wave or something like that, or come fall, um, we would end up back in phase one. We're out of that. We are in phase two right now. Um, Non-essential retail stores open for curb pickup, delivery. Um, and some of the uh, recreational activities are uh, okay. Now, I saw as of last night, there is talk about Illinois supposedly having met the criteria to move into phase three. So I, being it's Friday, we have a habit of doing this. We, we go live and then we go, oh, <laughs> the governor will be talking. We'll let you know afterwards. Um, so I think, again, um, we'll be waiting to see if Governor, governor Pritzker says something about um, moving into phase three. Um, I think the main thing would be everyone go get a haircut. <laughs> That's <laughs> the thing that everyone's waiting for. Uh, I got it. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then uh, small gatherings of 10 allowed face coverings are the norm. Um, that's where we are. We're not at it yet. That's where the discussion is. Um, and then phase four, um, it looks like gatherings of 50 or fewer. Um, you're talking about restaurants opening for in-house service, probably with six foot, um, social distancing, mandatory, um, um, provisions and things like that. Um, this is, um, the last, this is the second to last one before phase five, which would be fully reopened. The main thing to, to, to get from phase five, from what I see, is that phase five, is, phase five means there's a vaccine. Um, so I would think anywhere with, within three or four, if they all of a sudden come with a late breaking news story that they've got a vaccine, we'd move up much quicker. Um, but knowing how vaccines work, you know, first testing in them, getting them out there, distributed widespread and everything like that. Um, it's not, it's not near term. So um, now as you look at this, um, let's bring it back to association living. Um, we already knew what phase one was dealing with. We were pretty much just sheltering in place. Um, and phase two, now that we're there, I think we all know how this works. Um, particularly if you're, in a, if you're in a common interest and you got you know, common areas where you can walk around, um, you can pretty much walk around as you please. If you come into contact with groups of people, you just put a, put a mask on, um, which is kind of the statewide thing. Um, phase three is where it's going to get interesting because now we're talking about gatherings of 10 people or fewer. Um, so now we're starting to talk about, you know, I, I, I assume a lot of associations are going to look at phase three and go, uh, if they have um, uh, recreational facilities, pools, tennis courts, um, um, exercise areas, is that going to be where we start talking about opening things? Um, on the face, if you're talking about gatherings of 10 people or fewer, you know, from a practical standpoint, you know, a lot of the uh, exercise rooms that I've seen associations, you normally only have a couple people at any one time, but that's not to say if you've got a bigger one, say out in the Western suburbs, that they're not more full. Um, so this, we're gonna start having associations wonder if they should start opening things, I think three and especially four because now we're talking about 50 or or, or fewer now you, you are talking about maybe an entire um, exercise center or uh, a pool um, I would say and Bob jump in here as, as, a, as I finish my sentence right now today even though it's a really nice day out um, and I know we've got some nice weather coming up I would say that most practitioners and most managers if asked today are going to say don't open the pool don't open the exercise room. Is that right? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, even when you get to phase three, I think on the, the guidance that was issued, because this is just one of the many slides that's in there, there's actually a breakdown of each of the phases and what could get you to go forward and what could get you to go backwards. Um, at phase three, health clubs are allowed to open for outdoor activities. Uh, indoor activities can only be done one-on-one. -on -one. You know, things like that. You can't have a mass group of people. You can't have 10 people in there in a health club unless you have 10 employees in there, technically on one-on-one -on -one physical training type stuff. So I'm assuming even at phase three, most health clubs um, are expected still to be closed. At phase four, they're open as long as, you know, they maintain their safety standards. But I mean, we're at phase two. I believe Governor Pritzker yesterday announced that all regions, and there's 11 regions, if I recall correctly, uh, all 11 regions currently are on, on track with another two weeks to go, basically, uh, to be able to be opened up uh, by the end of the month to phase three, to move to progress to phase three. But that's obviously uh, dependent entirely on uh, testing and what comes through with that. Uh, you know, I, I was joked that it's based all on, on positive tests. So, so healthy people going there uh, is going to skew the results, uh, you know, as opposed to what it is. But uh, it is a good sign, obviously, if we have less people in hospitals, less positive tests, as long as everybody's still getting tested. But we don't want our recreational facilities to be the hotbed for um, these, these types of things. A lot of my clients are actually making the choice to, until we are uh, out there, we're, we're not going to open our pool. We're not going to be the source of the conduit for um, problems and how do we enforce only having so many people in there. A lot of these pools are non-lifeguarded, right? They're, they're, not, uh, they're not attended by anybody. How do we enforce this to make sure that we aren't going to be in trouble uh, for having too many people in a pool at one given time? Right. I, and I, I think, you know, to that point, to the question that might be out in the minds of many of the, of the board members, um, being overly cautious is probably not going to be a problem. So keeping things closed because you can't properly sanitize or, or properly ensure that the facilities will be safe. I just, again, I just don't see where you are going to be held, you know, negligent liable or whatever, you know, legal standard you want to look at by keeping it closed. Um, you know, Chicago as it is, you really don't get uh, good pool weather till mid June on, you know, you get, you get these onesie twosie days here in May. Um, and, you know, as far as outdoor um, exercise facilities, California and Florida still have those ones on the beach where they got the guys pumping iron on, on the beach. You really don't have it here again because it's not practical. What you do have is the the one-on-one -on -one training things with the tires and the ropes and things like that. But most associations aren't going to have that. Um, it's going to be your gym. So again, I, I mean, you know, as of today, May 15th, um, you know, the, the, the safe bet is to probably keep those facilities closed. Um, for the heck of it, Bats, we were talking about this before, I was able to pull, um, you know, some rules. Florida is a little bit ahead of us on opening up. I'm going to pop open you here. Uh, again, I want to stress, this is from Florida. This is not from Illinois. This is no one in Illinois is um, recommending this. But as you can see, they've given some guidelines on. This is an association too. This is one association's rules, right? This is actually from the department of, th their equivalent of the IDPFR in Florida. Okay. sent this to managers and board members and said, hey, based on the Florida edicts that are coming out, here are your guidelines. So again, I want to stress this is not um, from um, Illinois or from the IDPFR or anything that has to do with the state of Illinois, but they, they say, you know, limit the capacity to 50%, um, combine swimmers, individual sitting, um, gives you the, the six foot spacing for anyone sitting on the deck, um, they want the, the chairs and the tables to be clean. The point is they're giving some guidance. They're saying, Hey, do these things. Um, and this is, um, you know, this is going to, um, uh, you know, be relied on a, a, down there. But again, that is only Florida. I want to make sure that I'm clear about that. That is not Illinois. So, um, Another interesting thing that came out, and, and Betts and, and, and Bob and I were talking about before we went on air, is the Illinois Department of Professional Regulation gave some general guidelines for condominiums and common interest uh, kind of community associations. And um, I'm pleased to announce that it's pretty consistent with what you've been hearing on our webinars for the last couple of months here. Um, you know, shameless plug, by the way. I'm sorry? Shameless plug. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. We were right. <laughs> so, um, you know, let, let's, let's go to the first thing here. It's really a QA and a type of thing. Uh, you know, here, how do we do collections? It's, it's noting that collections are suspended, as we have been saying, which today, May 15th, nothing has changed. No notices can go out. No evictions can be filed. Sheriff isn't enforcing. Nothing has changed. So we are in a standstill yet um, again. Um, Betsy, do you have a question? Yes, I have a couple of questions. Okay. That came up. Uh, I was waiting because I figured we were going to get into this. What are thoughts on assessment collections going forward? Uh, well, a lot of it's going to depend on what happens legislation wise. There is some discussion about, so the General Assembly is going to uh, reconvene next week. There's discussions about a moratorium on collections related to any eviction type action. I, I've heard, again, you know, we haven't seen any proposed bills uh, for six months or 12 months. Uh, and the question is, is what's going to be given to the associations and landlords in, in response to that? Uh, at the federal level, they're talking about a moratorium on debt collection entirely. So not just evictions. You can't even sue somebody to collect something uh, for a time period. Whether the, either of those passes, you know, that's that that we have no idea right now, but that's what's out there. If either of those pass, obviously collections will be very different if not existent at all. Um, much to the chagrin of many attorneys uh, who do collections for people and a lot of debt collectors who do collections for people. Um, but I mean, assessment collections is going to, uh, unfortunately, at some point, we are going to see a very large increase in collections. Why? Because we're going to finally be able to do something legally for it. Um, the time period uh, for moratoriums on it will be done at some point. Um, and then those people who haven't done anything to talk to and communicate with their associations, uh, I expect will be, um, you know, fall, unfortunately, to the collection process and either go through the eviction process or through a normal debt collection process or both. Um, and then if, if for people who do, um, hopefully they are able to maintain whatever their uh, promises or whatever the association the leniency they gave them on payment plans, hopefully they're able to maintain that. If not, we're going to see a major increase in collections, probably similar to what happened like 2008 to 2010, but worse. Right. And, and so right now where we are is we're in the same spot we were before, assuming that, you know, none of this legislation gets pushed through. You'll be able to start doing your notices um, in, in June, uh, which, you know, when it comes to a condo, uh, the, the 30 day demand and demand for possession needs to go out first and 30 you know, we, we, we nickname it the 35 day, um, 30 days have to pass before you can file suit. So again, I, I, I think hopefully the legislators pick up on that. There's a lot of baked in time right now as is, um, because if we had to wait, if we have to wait till June 1st, the first thing we have to do is send out notices. And frankly, the law firms are going to be inundated, um, with getting notices out. It's going, it's going to take, it's going to take some time to get them out. Um, and then you will be able to file suit and then you got to make sure you have service and then you got to get a court date and then, you know, and then there's also, they also, you know, the, every, every jurisdiction in Northern Illinois, the first date up, if someone says, I want to get an attorney that will, that'll get them a continuance as well. So there, as is right now, if we start on June 1st and Bob agree, disagree, I bet you got to say it's 90 to 120 days before you'd be looking at from June 1st that you'd be looking at getting judgments before you get judgment. And then you're talking about a two month to six month delay set by the court. So you, you probably are talking about those types of time periods uh, just before you could actually uh, talk about eviction. If we can get people to evict for us. Um, it would not be the first time that the sheriffs in, you know, a sheriff uh, may not process evictions uh, if he feels like the conditions, regardless of a governor's, uh, you know, an order from the governor or not, um, whether or not he's going to process an eviction uh, at a time period. Uh, you know, it, it requires a lot of people in order for it to go light speed through the process. A lot of people are going to have to be on board with that, including judges and sheriff's departments, uh, right. which or, or, you know, isn't going to happen. You're not going to see judges just turn their eyes uh, and say, please, yes, evict all these people from their homes. Uh, instead, what they're going to do is do what they can to try to make it fair for everybody. 
Um, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, what I expect is, uh, you know, we're going to have a longer process when it is finally opened up. Right. And, you know, the th thing associations to keep in mind in these types of collection cases is um, obviously what you're trying to do is you're trying to get your budget back on track. Um, if these people don't have the money to pay the assessments, the judgment isn't going to necessarily speed it up. Um, right now, we're, what, what are we talking about? Unemployment of 20%. Guess what's not going to work out too well for us either? The post-judgment collection process, because we probably won't be able to garnish wages if they aren't working. The, and then finally, um, you know, are you going to have a robust rental market that you you need to, you know, if you do get your order of possession, you actually do evict, are you going to have people, you know, clamoring to get in? So that'll be another thing too. So and that's the same for a condo or, or a non-condo. All, right. all associations are in that same boat when we're doing collections. Yep. Uh, it doesn't matter what type you are. Just for clarification for um, our smaller associations or even larger ones that do not have professional management and or um, an attorney firm on retainer, do you need an attorney to go to cl collections for delinquent uh, assessments? You have to have an attorney uh, if you are a corporation, uh, not for private corporation, you are required to have an attorney represent you in a court of law. Okay. Right. And post judgment is something that, um, again, you would need a, an attorney to, which is, it's, it's the same proceeding, but it's a different set of steps. Would the association then be liable to pay that bill or would that be, could that be turned back by a judge to the, um, the delinquent homeowner? Well, when we file cases, um, we are always, uh, because the, when we're doing it on the eviction act, the eviction act allows us to recover our attorney's fees and costs from the defaulting owner. Um, whether you collect that from them is a different question. Uh, it's our job to try to collect that. Uh, and usually the threat of eviction is pretty good about you know getting us paid uh, as the association. Uh, but the association generally pays the attorney and then charges that cost back to the owner, which we hopefully will eventually collect on uh, from them. Okay, thank you. Let me ask a question. Um, I'll just put it out there generally. Um, 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, with, with a real estate mortgage crash. And then, um, we had a lot about what we're talking about now. And then, um, the FHA, uh, became the, the main underwriter of mortgages. And one of the issues became rentals, right? So they put their guidelines out and we weren't allowing rentals since that time we've, Bob and I have done a lot of amendments, declarations, um, capping rentals, mostly to come in line with that. Uh, underwriting requirement. That was usually the main thrust, but also because the, the notion is you don't want it. Right now, we're looking at, look, we, we got to be creative and everything like that. Um, if you've already got that cap in there, what do you do, right? You, you, theoretically, you'd have to amend, right, to allow the rental, unless you've got hardship. Right, unless you, can show, unless you have a hardship language, which we, we, I, I uh, generally write into almost every declaration amendment I do on leasing. Right. So if you've got a cap, if, you, if, if you've got a recent amendment, let's look at the, this way, and you had an attorney do it, and hopefully they put hardship language in there, um, you might want to start dusting off that language and start thinking about it. Because if someone says, hey, look, I, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to make assessments. However, you know, maybe I could rent it or something like that. This might be the time, uh, at least for one round or something like that, for associations to look at it, um, because you're going to have to be creative to keep your budgets in line. All right, should I keep going on the IDPFR bets? I think we should, yeah, let's okay. continue with that. All right, so the next question they says, uh, are under current law, are virtual board meetings acceptable? Yes, they are. Um, the, You'll notice yes in, que in quotations. Yes, right, right. So, and I think that's what we're saying too, right? I, again, uh, the thing we've been saying for the last couple of months is act now, ask forgiveness later. The only issue is some people may have not opted in for electronic notice. Um, somehow you're going to have to get around that. Um, I've had some where we, we have, you know, smaller associations, self-managed, they've been able to get in touch with everyone. So even though they ne haven't necessarily opted in, in this instance, we were able to get a hold of them and say, hey, we're doing this on Zoom. So yes, uh, you know, they are allowed. Um, and I've, I've done some with mixed results, frankly. Uh, I haven't had a bad one yet, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, people got a lot more energy when they're sitting at home in their easy chairs versus at seven o'clock on a Wednesday night and they just want to go home. These, some, some of these, you know. So on the other side of that um, topic, can an association use the issues with, you know, COVID-19 and not gathering in large groups as an excuse not to hold a meeting if they choose not to do technological 
Well, let's substitute the word excuse with reason. Um, I think, you know, again, it's, it's up to the individual boards and every board's different. Um, you know, let's give the extreme. We've got a smaller condo building, eight units, everyone's uh, a bit older, and we've got one tested positive for COVID. Um, you know, we're certainly not gonna get together in person. You know, it might be hard even with um, people that are not technologically adept at these things. So, you know, if they didn't, how could you fault them for it? Um, versus, you know, maybe a younger board where everyone's kind of, you know, on, on video um, already, um, they can go ahead and do it. I, I think, I think one thing's for sure, this is the new reality, and we're, it, it's, it's, it's kind of setting in a little bit longer. So boards that have not had their meetings probably should start to say, hey, you know, I don't know, maybe we can use my phone, my, my iPhone, we'll do it that way. At least start testing it if, they're, if they haven't been comfortable with it, or if they have an attorney, if they have a management company they work with, look to them to see if they can host it. For the self-managed ones, you know, start asking around, who's, who's, who's the geek around here? that might be able to host this thing uh, and get it going because, um, you know, again, you, you have to have four meetings. It's not four meetings per quarter. It's not four meetings every so many days. It's four meetings. Um, you still have time. It's only May, but it depends. If something's important, you might want to get it going. Um, I, you know, yeah. And, and if we're talking about annual meetings, like a lot of associations have their annual meeting in November, but there are many who have it right now, right? There's many of them that are supposed to be right now. It's supposed to be, um, have already happened or it's supposed to happen in the next couple of months. Uh, if you're in a condo, you know, you're not going to be able to get together to meet, uh, to have an annual meeting in person. Uh, and you need 120 days before you can adopt electronic uh, voting rules. Uh, it, and then you can start your election process. You know, so you, you need a window there. Condos, if they haven't had their annual meeting yet, are probably not going to have their annual meeting if they're supposed to until the end of the year. Um, and then for non-condos, you actually don't need that 120-day cooling off period. Um, so you could technically push those through if you wanted to, to have your meeting, you know, in the middle of the summer. Uh, what is clear, though, is that you would get back on schedule after this year. So let's say you end up, you're supposed to have your meeting in April. It got canceled because of COVID. You end up having your election in November or December. Um, those people who are elected, if they only have a one-year term, are going to serve until April when you're supposed to be back on track for your annual election. Uh, if your documents say you shall have it in April, you need to have it in April unless you can't. So um, that would mean those people would serve maybe five or six months um, and then you would have another election in which hopefully uh, we can ha we can hold in, uh, appropriately and get that on track for one year at a time. And in the condo, I mean, I, I would also put the caveat with the 120 day rule. If somehow you can get people to do it voluntarily, which, you know, if you've got a big association, it might be hard. Um, if ever, again, if you have unanimous, you have all your homeowners say, fine, fine, fine. You get that within 20 days. I would say you can roll with it because you've got unanimous consent of every homeowner. But if you have some people that are, are, are not responding and things like that, you know, question, you know, can you really roll forward with it? The law says no right now. So, um, so the next thing in the IDPFR thing was about allowing business, a bus building personnel in. Um, you know, and again, I would hope that unless it's an emergency that an association is not, not doing some of the, the other things that they normally would do, like maybe the, I don't know, the, um, the dryer duct cleaning or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, if, if we're not gonna have dry dry cleaning, you know, as a homeowner, you might wanna see if you can do some of that stuff yourself because some of those things that associations get in, come in for are, are routine maintenance to make sure things are okay, testing of smoke alarms and dryer duct cleaning and, and, and things of the like. So um, again, the, the IDPFR advises that you can request that they don't come in unless it's an emergency. Um, I think I agree with that. Um, and this one, we talked about the, the five phase approach to um, going back to normal. Um, I, I think we kind of covered this, but it's the same, same thing too, depending on where you are in the, in the phase as to what you can or, or should do. Uh, uh, I, I want to interject here. We sure. do have a couple of comments about the pool issue mm -hmm. um, after, <clears throat> excuse me, after you discussed it, that um, we know that the, or we've been told that the virus um, does not multiply or survive in water, okay? In other words, we're not transferring it to other people um, in a pool. However, is it um, contingent on the fact that you have, I know you have 
10, only 10 people at a time. And that includes people sitting on the, you know, the deck around the pool. What about the washroom? You probably need to have a washroom, uh, I would think, in your pool area, or at the very least, a dressing room changing area. Um, would you say that, you know, if they did open the pool, that they would not open the indoor part of it? Yeah, I mean, you're also outdoors, which is another issue that seems to be more acceptable than having it in, enclosed. But what about the areas surrounding it or the amenities such as the bathroom? Well, I mean, like water fountain. I think a water fountain is required under the IDPH rules. Uh, you have to have a water fountain. That sounds like a, a hotbed for problems for, to me. Um, and I think it's required to be operational. It is required to have that on uh, in order to have a pool that is allowed to run. Uh, it's a licensure requirement. So that, that's the biggest concern is, is I, I don't know the science of whether or not, you know, when you're swimming in a chlorinated pool or whatever, you know, whatever you use in your pool, whether or not that is transmittable. But I do know that uh, what's been said is, is contact it's transmittable. And I assume people spitting uh, and potentially getting on each other sound like a bad, bad policy to have. Happen. So, um, I don't. I don't know uh, the science of it. I do know that I like to be cautious when it's potential uh, problem associated areas. That you know, the pool opening uh, on, for Memorial Day may be a little aggressive, um, considering what we don't know right now um, in our communities. Yeah, and I think the bat to the bathroom question. You know, that's again an impractical thing because you, pr you pretty much should be sanitizing after every use. So you'd almost have to have someone stationed outside there uh, right? because, you know, people, once they come out of the pool and go to the bathroom, now you're talking about just water, just sitting there and everything else. So it's, it's, I, I don't see how you could have, I, I don't, I, I'll put it this way. I don't see how you could have that bathroom pertinent to the pool open um, and keep it. Sanitary. Well, just a comment. Um, I've been getting a lot of questions um, with the weather getting better. Yes, that's a factor, but also with phase three, allowing more people to go back to work and things to open where they may have children and the children are not in school and it's like they're not homeschooling anymore what do the children do all day and you know i guess in some communities they're accustomed to allowing them to be you know in the pool area or you know playing in the tennis courts or whatever so i think um we just need to be aware there's no answer to this it's just a comment that there is a lot of pressure on boards in many places to open the pool at least. Um, yeah. And you know, it's, it's hard to justify why you're not opening it. If in fact you don't have the bathroom open and you know, you, you don't, um, uh, it, it, it isn't transfer the disease, the virus is not transferable within the water. So, you know, I'm just saying it is a very, very, sticky issue right now and it's yeah, and I, I don't know if i agree that it's not transferable i, I mean i'm a science i like science i like things being shown to me that it, it's impossible for it to happen um and i think you, you should be conservative as long as we're talking about potential liability that's out there we want to be conservative as much as possible regardless my concern is is who is monitoring the pool most of our associations to have pools don't have lifeguards they are not monitored places. There, there's a post-it, no lifeguard on duty. That sounds like it's a recipe for disaster in the event somebody from the IDPH comes by and does a nice little inspection. Um, while we're there, all of a sudden we are in violation with our common elements uh, of a state uh, enforced provision. Granted, a lot of counties are deciding they're not gonna enforce it. And we don't want to, you know, it's not our job to get into the political decision of whether it's a good idea or a bad idea to be opened up or st shut down. All we can tell you is, is whether, you know, based off of what happens, what our potential solution is. Right now, it sounds like there is liability out there for pool related issues. Right, and, and just for clarification, I did hear her myself. The Illinois Department of Health um, uh, director does believe that the virus can be transferred in the pool. It's the CDC that's stating that it shouldn't be an issue. So I'm certainly not going to jump in the one pool governmental and body says something and another says another. Oh. Yeah, I'm not going to cannonball into the pool if someone oh, says they got do. COVID. <laughs> right. I mean, the one thing for boards to keep in mind is even in good times when you're not dealing with COVID you're going to have a contingent of people that aren't happy with your decision anyway. Gather the facts, consult with those people you normally consult with, make an informed decision. Um,
but you know, it, it, right now it, it's the mechanics of opening a pool. It's just not good. <laughs> so, well, I mean, this is a good segue into like talking about rules and regulations yes. and how, how we adopt those and how we enforce them. Because in reality, uh, a lot of our associations don't have any restriction that says we shall, we're, we're enforcing anything. Instead, what we send out is a letter that says, please adhere to the CDC guidelines. They haven't adopted a rule that says, uh, if you are outside your door, you need to wear a mask. Um, I mean, many of downtown associations probably have because they have, you know, very large number of people going through well, that's a good minor point. common areas like a front door. Right. A lot of our, a lot of our suburban clients are, you know, four, four flats essentially that are connected. Um, you know, that is a, it's less, less people coming through. They maybe haven't adopted as many rules. So, you know, if you are looking to enforce something, you need a rule that says you should, you can enforce it. Um, there is some provisions in the documents that say we can enforce ordinance. Uh, I, I like to not rely on that. I like to have an actual rule that says thou shall wear a face mask when outside of your, your door to your unit, you should have a face mask on. You know, I want things like that. Um, but at the same time, we have to be cognizant of there are other laws in play. Uh, we, we did a nice little seminar uh, a year ago. Laws that affect associations. Two of the biggest ones out there are the FHA, the Fair Housing Act, and the Illinois Human Rights Act. If somebody needs something and they make a request for something related to a disability, you have to accommodate them. You're obligated to accommodate, you provide a reasonable accommodation. That, that's whether you're a condo, co-op, uh, homeowners association, whatever, you have to provide a reasonable accommodation if it's necessary for them to be able to function. So it, you, you have to be cognizant of that uh, when you're doing a rule that says uh, nobody can come to the association. Well, if I can't perform tasks myself, you have to allow me to have people who can perform tasks for me come to help me. That's a Fair Housing Act and Illinois Human Rights Act condition. So if, if, if let's say I, uh, I have a, a, an impairment, my arm, I, I, one of my arms doesn't work and I can't do everything for myself because of that. You have to allow me to have someone come cook for me if I can't do it myself or if I can't clean myself, clean for myself because I have a, a condition uh, that makes it it's too painful to do stuff. You have to permit that to happen or you risk being sued under the FHA and the Illinois Human Rights Act. Uh, and, and so what I, I, I advise associations as much as possible is have a paper trail that says what we are doing, what we're enforcing, and therefore require people to abide by, but then also be willing to budge on issues where someone has a condition where they're required, you're required to accommodate that condition. Um, if, if we're talking about pools, if you are, your pool is open to the public, uh, I think the conditions are very different. Uh, than if you're just talking about believing, because then you're talking about a place of public accommodation. You're talking about compliance with all ordinances. It's not a private club anymore. It's a public place. So you have to comply with everything that's out there. There's no leniency uh, based off of local locality and it's it be, being a private club. And so to your, to your point, Bob, because we, we, we've, in recent years, we've made sure in terms of rule writing, We've gotten away from saying thou shall not or you cannot or this is prohibited versus to saying this is what is pro is okay. So, uh, for example, the hallway, um, no playing, no ball playing in the hallway versus we, we, we would not use that any longer. We'd say the hallway shall be used only for ingress and egress. So with that in mind, um, the pools, you, you and I kind of joke a lot of times we'll, we'll see some old pool rules and be like, oh, boy, this one is all got to go, you know can't come in the pool with a sore. So, or, or uh, adult diapers, adult swims, all these things that discriminate against other people, you can't do. So you can't, theoretically, uh, you can't come around the pool if you've been diagnosed with COVID. <laughs> The federal law really doesn't give you much support on that, right? Well, I think that might be okay. That one might be okay, be okay because, okay. because okay. There's a, there is a, a rule that does talk about if you have an infectious disease, which I, I assume uh, COVID would be classified as one. Uh, and that one would probably be okay, but you can't still have adult only. You can't have, hey, you have to have an adult with a child. You can't do that. Uh, that that's prohibited. You have to have someone of suitable age and discretion, which can be as low as like 12 or 14 years old. So, you know, it's not, uh, the, a lot of our associations throughout the area have those really old rules that probably are violative of both the Fair Housing Act and the Illinois Human Rights Act. 
Right. So, I mean, the point, the point is they, they're going to have to be careful. I think you, you were kind of alluding it to, especially like letting in um, daycare workers and things like that for people that need them. Um, because I, I think some buildings have been really strict with prohibiting third parties from coming in. But if it's someone who needs help with dialysis or some type of physical therapy, you know, I, I don't see how in light of FHA um, and, and, and human, Illinois human rights and all that, that they can prohibit it. So they're going to have to be careful about that. Um, the other thing is this, that um, so much of what associations are doing is relying on the policies that are being thrown out there by governmental agencies. Um, do boards, should boards be having these meetings on a regular basis to codify these rules? You know, even in normal times, I get boards, they'll be like, in the middle of the year, like, you know, this has been going on. I'm like, We'll do a rule now. We don't have to wait once a year to pass a rule. We tend to do that. We look at them more. We look at everything else. But there's nothing that says come July, you know, people are shooting off fireworks. Hey, there's been a lot of them. We're going to do it right now. We're going to pass this rule that says you can't do it. So with this COVID thing, you can go ahead and, and, and draft the rules, circulate them, and have a vote. Um, should they be doing that? Uh, let, me, let me ask this question, though. If, what if you passed a rule that was kind of open-ended and just said, you are bound to follow the CDC current recommendations, uh, you know, like for masks and uh, social distancing. And from time to time, uh, the association will post these and you say where it's gonna be posted on the doors or whatever. I mean, is it, can it be an open-ended rule? The only issue that I can see is if you don't make it an actual rule, obviously the association is not going to be the rule police or the COVID police, but um, at least you can go back later and have a fine. So it might have a few people, cause a few people to think twice before they violate it. But technically, there's nothing that an association can do to require people to really do this if they choose not to, correct? Well, I mean, we can't physically force anybody to do anything. No. Like we can't put our hands upon people and throw a mat and attach a mask to the back of their head uh, into the front of their face. We cannot do that. Um, but what we do is, is we are able to uh, use our own enforcement procedures uh, in, in, you know, find people for conduct that violates our restrictions. But if you look at the, the enforcement policies, it's for violation of the declaration or rules and regulations or the by, in some places the bylaws especially mm -hmm. in Cook County. It's, it, I guess the question, you, your first question is, can we just implement the CDC guidelines? Um, and I, I guess I would say, I, I don't think you should implement the CDC guidelines in their entirety in the rules because uh, some of those guidelines may not be effective, you know, may not apply to you as an association. And in cases like this, where the LA Department of Public Health may dis disagree with the CDC, we may have a problem associated with saying, oh, you have to adhere to that. I adhered to that, which meant I could go in the pool because it's not a, it's not a hotbed. Um, so I, I risk, I, I, I'm always concerned about saying we're going to adhere to a, a, a second body of law that we don't control. Um, and then all of a sudden, what if the, the CDC tomorrow says, you know, you, should, you don't have to wear a mask? Right now, it's a recommendation that you do, right? It's not a requirement that you do uh, in, in the, at the federal level. Um, so if, if they don't require it, okay, you recommend it to me. You adhere to the CDC guidelines. I listen to your recommendation. You know, people start playing lawyer and, uh, you know, find a nice little fine loopholes uh, as to why they should or should not do something. So I would rather see a provision that says, wear a mask when you're outside your door. Okay. And the final part of that IDPFR just did cover, oh no, there's two more actually, about the mask that says, you know, you're, you're, you're well advised to do that. Um, and then the final one is construction work repair or repair work permitted. And that was, as we said weeks ago, that was an essential service. And from what I see, Home Depot is going strong as ever. <laughs> yeah, I, hope, I hope everybody bought stock in Menards, Home Depot, if they're publicly traded companies, because yeah. I think they're having their, their, their record quarters. Yeah, so so that's all going on. Um, obviously, by the way, I'm not giving I'm not giving advice to purchase stock for the record. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so we do, again, we, we would hope that if people are looking to do optional work in their units now, maybe they show a little restraint um, and not put their boards under the gun, asking them to do it. However, if you have a pipe that lets loose, I, I got a call a couple of days ago about a hot water here that blew up. Um, you got to deal with it. Um, 
you got to mitigate the, the the damage and everything like that. So definitely that that's always been the case. Um, but pretty much the IDPFR agrees with everything that's been coming out of our mouth for the last couple of weeks. Let's say that one more time. Um, I'm going to switch now. Uh, Betsy had found this for us. In, in addition to the IDPFR, the city of Chicago um, put this. This is kind of interesting. This is guidance for multifamily residential buildings. And um, where the IDPFR was pretty macro and global, this is a little more specific. Um, I'm not really going to break it down too much. This is more about cleaning and things like that and policies. Again, I will put this up on our website so you can go ahead and download this. Um, but it is a lot more detailed uh, if you read through it, um, what to do, you know, some protocols for cleaning and things like that. Uh, actually, a, a little more uh, effort put into this document, if you ask me. Betsy, did you have a question? <laughs> no, I, I was just going to make a comment that um, we did have a request. If you're putting these uh, documents up on your website, Bill, is it possible for us to somehow get the questions that were asked and answered today during the webinar and have that posted? That was a, um, a comment from someone. Yes, well. I believe I believe I will get a transcript of the questions okay. that were typed in, and I will actually Great. be able to do that. So, so okay, so I'll make sure I'll make a note. Post questions and answers. That's a new one. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, should we stop right there and on COVID for today and uh, move into ask an attorney about any topic that happens to be uh, on someone's mind? Yeah, with, with with the qualification that I think we we're all talking ahead of time that. Um, the one interesting little topic, and I'll throw it out there if anyone wants to, to follow up with a question, is um, at what point can, can or will boards and associations um, wander into the liability for negligence and breach of fiduciary duty for doing nothing? Um, the, the, the best example we always use in the law is ice, right? A natural, an unnatural accumulation of ice. Uh, you get a sudden ice storm in October, your, your snow guys aren't even coming out yet, the contract hasn't kicked in, you got a big puddling, and then it turns to ice, someone slips, hurts themselves, typically because that was such a sudden occurrence and there was nothing that you know the association could have done, you wouldn't necessarily uh, expect an association to be held um, liable under a negligence theory with something like that. Now, we get to mid-January, February, there's an area maybe of an entrance or something where people commonly use it, say like from the garage to the building or something like that. And repeated notifications from owners, there's ice, can you please take care of it? Um, pictures are sent over and over and over and over. And then someone slips and falls. Now you wander into the known or should have known analysis. Um, the association was notified about this accumulation. They should have known they should have taken action. They sat on their hands, harm followed. That, you start um, seeing that the association and the board would be held liable for inaction. Um, so here again, you know, with the COVID thing, if the boards are remaining totally radio silent, having no meetings, sending out no communication, knowing about this, um, you know, will, will some lawyers try to start poking at them and saying you should have done this? Don't know. Again, one thing for sure, every judge is going to be slow to the extent there is any litigation comes out of, of this. The judges will be slow in how they will handle these cases because there's not going to be something they can look back on. I, I don't know if there's litigation related to the Spanish flu epidemic of, of the early 1900s where we can pull old case law and see things like that. I have no idea. Um, but I know that I, my, my sense is judges will not have a lot to rely on. So with that, if we want to open up to ask an attorney, we're ready. Okay, I do have a couple of questions here. Um, they're kind of COVID related, but that's what Of course. Um, uh, so it's a little, there's a town home association. Uh, they uh, postponed their April annual meeting, you know, for the members. Um, and they had a phone in regular board meeting last week and they're having another one next week and that would be their fourth required board meeting of the year can they cancel meetings for the rest of the year and avoid holding an annual meeting and election until uh we're all in phase five yes with quotations <laughs> right 
<laughs> so, so if you've made your four board meetings, you technically have complied with the law. If you're in a condo or a common interest community association subject to SICA, you, 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 would, you would have complied with your four meeting uh, rule requirement for the board meeting. You have not held your annual meeting, but if you cannot physically hold the annual meeting because of uh, COVID, uh, then I, I would expect you wouldn't be blamed for that as long as you were, when it gets to the point of being able to have gatherings and use the technology you can use, um, that you'd be able to do it. Now, they said it was a townhome association. Let me say whether it's a big one or a small one. Um, so I'm going to assume it's a big one uh, and that they probably would have complied with their four meeting requirements. Okay, so they had their four meetings, but um, can they make decisions now that come up or say they have to uh, change contractors or whatever? Uh, don't they have to do that in a public uh, open meeting or they're is supposed that... to yes it, the law requires it to be done at an open meeting okay so if they have to wait until phase five it could be conceivably six or more months so they really can't conduct any business either is that correct right. if they had all their ducks in a row they'd be fine right bill with, well, with the exception of emergency stuff they always can right. deal with that stuff but yes right if, if somehow you got it all taken care of and you're good from may till december 31st you guys are an efficient board. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't imagine, but anyway. Okay, uh, here's a good one. Should we, uh, should the HOA have a rule for no fireworks this year because there won't be any displays anywhere? Well, I think what classy fireworks are still illegal in Illinois anyway. So to the extent that you didn't realize those people coming from Indiana and Michigan and Wisconsin bringing those fireworks, that was illegal to begin with. Um, yeah, you probably should because those were illegal to begin with. I, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I, I would say every board has the option to do it. If you're kind of HOA, obviously condo people shouldn't be going on the common elements and shooting, uh, shooting fireworks off really? and we really don't want them to do it from their balconies. Um, but uh, you know, the HOAs, could they adopt a restriction on it? Yes. Good luck enforcing it. You know, as soon as it gets in the air, it's really hard to tell where it came down to, that that one's yours. So you better have video evidence to try to enforce it. Uh, for something such a patriotic as shooting off fireworks. And, and again, I will emphasize that most of the fun fireworks are banned in Illinois anyway, so I'm not really sure what your guys are dealing with. Um, you know, sparklers, snakes, and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I guess you can go ahead and ban those, but they shouldn't okay. be that's what you're blowing good off anyway. So, Do we have any information on when the courts will be back in session? I have some court proceedings next week via Zoom. It's going to be fun. Me too. I will be doing some video. Via yeah via Zoom, I've done conference calls. Um, so they're starting to open up. Um, the problem is, is evictions are prohibited under the governor's order. Um, so that is to be determined, uh, either until somebody challenges it and uh, gets declared unconstitutional for everybody, uh, and therefore the courts open up. And then the counties themselves allow evictions to happen because before the governor prohibited them from happening, the counties themselves <laughs> prohibited them from happening in the short term. So uh, we have to get the counties on board as well uh, for that. That's the cases most people care about. They usually don't care about the, uh, the chancery cases where we're talking about somebody's grass being too high or fence color being the wrong color. Uh, we usually are talking about evictions, which uh, as far as we know is gonna be June 5th, but we'll see. And know that if you're if you're in some heady litigation, um, discovery was always able to continue. So there's certain functions of cases if you're in big nasty litigation that is still going on. Um, you just don't really see it in person. Okay, so our last question here. Um, actually, um, we talked about incorporating it before. Um, it re it's regarding insurance. Okay, um, and maybe this will be. <laughs> Uh, a good uh, suggestion for our follow-up webinar uh, that should the board and the managers contact their insurance agent to increase their DNO coverage at this time and or have an umbrella to cover COVID related um, liability? I wouldn't be so concerned about your DNO coverage. Um in terms of, of, of increasing it. Um, what's, the, what's the standard DNO policy? I mean, it, it's it's million. a million dollars. I mean, I, 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 again, DNO is gonna come where you, you've got board members have done something so beyond the pale that you know, they're gonna get sued individually. Um, I, I be, wouldn't be so concerned about that. My, you know. Well, DNO, DNO coverage might come into place if like say you get sued for not cleaning the common elements. Right. And somebody, um, 
get sick from touching the common elements, right. improve from our common elements. Uh, you know, we, we, the association's DNO coverage would, you know, hopefully provide protection. Whether there's an exclusion for COVID-related stuff might be an entirely different question. It's probably going to be an exclusion from your hazard in property liability insurance. Uh, DNO is probably the only place you really find coverage for it. Um, should they go and get it? Uh, I think that's a question they all have to answer for themselves with their insurance broker. That's really, yeah, you, like now is the time to have a conversation with your insurance broker to figure out uh, whether or not you are properly insured and covered. Uh, because if you are not, uh, there's no time like the present to fix it. And I think the, the interesting question will be, will there be any uh, COVID related claims for associations? You know, maybe, maybe some with COVID came in your, your, your belt, in your, um, um, your, your, uh, what for your what what the uh, the the by the lobby. elevator yeah the lobby oh my god how did I not think of the word lobby so your lobby and let's say you know you find out that someone had it and you have to bring in like the heavy guns for cleaning um, is that an insurable event I don't know um, I'm certainly starting to see a lot of seminars um, covering COVID related claims more on the business side you know business for business interruption insurance saying hey look because the governor we had to shut down you know your your typical business interruption insurance may or, or is designed to replace income you normally get it's, it's going to be really interesting on that spectrum um but association wise i'm not i'm not really sure where the specific claims will lie sounds like a good idea for a future seminar sure so i right so i know i said we had the last one but we have two more they will okay. be okay hey it's friday we got time we'll be generous here uh can open forum be held by having residents submit questions beforehand and then be answered at the end of the meeting. Must they be allowed to speak if they've been given the opportunity to submit those questions prior? Would that cover the, the requirement that you have the open forum? So condo and SECA are different, right, Bob? Right, so condo doesn't have an open forum requirement at all. Um, SECA associations do. So uh, the only required open forum is under SECA. Um, it does not state whether or not uh, questions written in advance are, are, are acceptable as the only form of, you know, presenting information to the board or whether it has to be an actual um, physical portion where they can actually ask questions with their mouth. Um, could, could I see that uh, working? Yes, if it's properly done. Um, could I see it, uh, could I see a lot of people upset about it? Absolutely, because a lot of people are used to the traditional governmental body where you see the person at the school board meeting standing up explaining why they think something should be a certain way for their kids. Uh, and that's what we're traditionally expecting out of an open forum. So I would expect uh, a lot of uh, judges would probably interpret it to be the uh, people have to have the ability to speak. Again, I would also say, though, interesting times, interesting measures. Yep. What would your damage be? You had an opportunity, USFL case. Here's your one dollar. Bye bye. You know you didn't get. To okay. Last question: Are there any privacy concerns that a condo board should consider when updating the building entry system with one that has a camera and audio, like the, the ring uh, doorbell, for buildings with entries to a maximum of four condo units? Any privacy issues with that? I mean. Ring doorbells and, and cameras are, are basically becoming the norm. Uh, I, you have no expectation of privacy outside your home and outside a door. The, at, at most, if you're talking about a hallway, you're talking about a semi-private area where you really have no expectation of privacy anyways because other people can see you physically where you are. So the only time we're worried about the ring uh, doorbells and security cameras is when they are pointing directly into other people's spaces. Now, if it's my door is facing your door, there's nothing you can do about that. But it's when my camera, my security camera is pointing directly at your bedroom window. Yeah, it sounds like that's a concern we should be having. But there is no true privacy concern associated with videotaping people in, in private or in, in non-private areas um and also to, to keep in mind if you're depending ring ring i know has a cloud-based recording um capability um once you start recording it it becomes a record of the association wouldn't you agree well if it's our camera sure if it's our camera right so to the extent we're doing that you know under a section 19 request theoretically video would be something we'd have to be able to turn over or make 
it's not one of the enumerated things though. That's not one of the things that's enumerated that someone would have to provide you. So, or you'd have to give to somebody. That's true. Right, right, right. right. Not, uh, you know, financials or something like that. Would it be discoverable? Absolutely. Discoverable, right, right. Um, and the question is, is if we have those cameras and something happens, have we, do we have a policy for making sure we preserve that information so that way we don't look like we are uh, spoiling evidence? It's called spoliation of evidence. Right. Uh, if you allow something to be destroyed or altered that you should have known was important to somebody else in, in their litigation, you can be liable for that. Right. Okay. Good time to, to stop. We want to thank our panel. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bob. And of course, all of you who tuned in today, please stay safe and enjoy the improving weather. Okay. <laughs> Until Bye. next time. Thank you. Have a great night, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>